Welcome everybody. We are delighted to see you. What would be fabulous is could you have a look at the uh, chat box and pop the chat box out and tell us where in the world you are today and uh, what's brought you to this uh, wonderful art forum today. And uh, we are delighted to have you. Do uh, if children are welcome, dogs are welcome. If they get too noisy, we might ask you to, to put yourself on mute. And, uh, but the important thing is we'd love to hear that uh, where you are in the world today. Uh, by the way, I'm Diane Wilkinson. I had never run a webinar until March, April last year, and uh, now run webinars regularly for teams and uh, am an Art Week fan. And uh, hence, uh, I was asked by my dear friend, Susie Moxley, if we could do a webinar, and I was very excited. So pop in the chat box where you are in the world today, so we have Frank, we have John Duncan, Mary Lines, we have Kathy, and also if you could make sure that your name, we know that some people uh, loan their laptops to children or to parents, and you may have a different name on your laptop to who you actually are. And uh, Kath Nightingale, we're delighted to have you here. Oh, and we can see Banksy is showing up as well. Delighted to have Banksy. Thank you, Frank, but it might not be Frank, it might be somebody else. So if you can pop, we have Debbie Page. Hello, Debbie, and you're a potter. Uh, wonderful. Um, welcome, everybody. Do what we really encourage is Akiko, Tiffany, Francesca, Shakespeare. We'd love your videos on. If you can pop your video on, if you could, um, there is going to be an opportunity to be asking questions of our wonderful curator and artists this evening. And uh, welcome to Hilly. We have Jane, we have Marion, Robin, Nicholas Hardiman. We have Emma Col Coleman Jones, Nikki, Teresa, and uh, Marie, or is it Mary? Welcome and Esme, lovely to see you, Esme. Hi, Esme, I think I do know who you are. And uh, is it Granny Sheila? Granny Sheila, give a wave. And uh, lovely to have you with us. So do keep popping in the chat box. Oh, Hilly, you're in Cornwall, we're delighted to hear that. We have Becky Payton in Oxford, and we have Kevin and Alex in Spain. A a welcome to you. Belinda, give us a wave, Belinda, that you're in New York and uh, equally a fan of Art Week in, in Oxfordshire and uh, delighted that we've got somebody from New York with us today as well. And we have Bev Jones, who's in Botley. That's wonderful, Bev. So keep popping in the chat box where you are. And also, if you could pop in the chat box, what's brought you here uh, this evening. We know that it's our first uh, art forum and our first art forum online. It's the 18th art forum, I do believe. Susie, give me a thumbs up. Is it the 18th art forum? Absolutely. And uh, but the first one. So we are ready to start. So uh, Esther, as you come off mute and uh, we would, I would like to hand over to Esther, Esther Lafferty, who is the uh, in charge of Oxfordshire Art Weeks, Esther. And uh, we look forward to a welcome from you, Esther. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Welcome to our 18th Art Forum. So this is an event that's presented annually by Summertown artists within Oxfordshire Art Weeks. Um, Oxfordshire Art Weeks, as I'm sure you all know, is a feast of open studios and pop-up exhibitions that encompasses a wealth of art, um, craft and design and other treasures from paintings to pottery, sculpture, glass art, fashion and furniture. And it's happening right now and at hundreds of venues across the whole county. Um, festival visitors can talk to individual artists about their inspiration and their ideas. And it's always fascinating to hear what they have to say. What's special, I think, about the Art Forum 
is that it brings something different, it adds something else into that mix because we bring together several artists, um, this year a curator, into a single conversation. And that encourages us all to talk about art more broadly. So previous forums have asked, for example, wide ranging questions such as what is art? Or they've explored the link between art and science. Um, and tonight, I'm excited that we bring, the, we bring you this discussion on a topic that's really dominated the news and all of our lives for the last year. Um, COVID forced us, many of us, to rethink the way we live and the way we work. And last spring, lockdown forced Oxfordshire Art Weeks to reinvent itself online, um, which was a bit of a panic a year ago, but um, it was a real success, I think. We hosted um, a virtual festival on a website with online art trails and galleries and video tours and more. And so the legacy of the last year for Art Weeks is that this online art showcase, which can be enjoyed by anybody anywhere in the world, um, will continue to be an integral element of the May Festival in future. And so I'm now looking forward to hearing more about the impact of the pandemic on the artist speakers tonight and, and curator speaker, um, and to learn how it, COVID has influenced or altered their plans for the future. Um, so um, I'll now hand you back to Diane. Uh, thank you so much, Esther. And uh, by the way, if people are wondering who I am, I am just an Art Week faithful. I'm one of those that goes, where's my brochure? And invite my friends. And uh, so I'm not an artist or a curator, but I do know how to run online webinars. So uh, thank you to, to Joe, who is supporting all of us. So I'm going to share slides. And what I'm going to do is be sharing slides in between and uh, as we've said, this is the 18th Art Forum, and we're particularly going to be focusing today on our response to COVID. And we have a, a Ruth Charity, who is a curator, and we have three wonderful artists with us this evening, Miranda Preswell, Susan Moxley, who's really been the mover and shaker behind all of this. Susie, thank you and to uh, Tom Croft. So it has been, uh, we really look forward to hearing from each of them what their response has been to COVID. So we're going to start with Ruth. And Ruth started her career um, with the British Council. And she was also curator at the Photographers Gallery in London. She worked at the Mead Gallery at the Warwick Art Centre. And if we roll on to today, she was the, she currently works for Oxford Hospitals Charity. And she was the founder of Artlink. And what impresses me with Ruth and how she works is that she has this ability to be able to find and commission artists and often it's uh, new artists that perhaps haven't been um, well known yet and to find the right place for that art at the right time with the right audience and so for example here is a painting uh, called kids by michael craig martin and it's in the john radcliffe a hospital uh, in the West Wing atrium. And isn't this just wonderful? And this was arranged and organized by Ruth. So uh, Ruth, it's what I've really valued is understanding more about you as a curator. I, I will say in, in my, I had always imagined that curators were more museum based and you've helped me to see that uh, not at all. So really uh, you've opened uh, my eyes certainly and we look forward to hearing how you are going to open our eyes uh, this evening. So for each of the artists, uh, I will be asking two questions. Looking back, how have you responded to COVID? And then looking ahead, how or what will you carry forward? And uh, so Ruth, I'm going to stop sharing at this point. And the question, as you know, Ruth, that I'm asking is looking back, how have you as a curator responded to COVID? 
Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's lovely also to see lots of familiar faces on the screen. Um, actually, if we go straight, I think, to the first slide, um, everything changed a year ago or a year and a bit ago. Um, we, most of my focus of my work is on creating um, environmental improvement projects for wards and departments. Um, and we have a very lively exhibition program as well. Um, and one of the projects that we were right in the middle of was a program of artwork for our new emergency building. And what happened in March 2020 was that suddenly I was unable to go into the hospital. So all the projects that we were in the middle of had to be paused, um, including a lovely project with Miranda, which no doubt she will talk about later. Um, if you move to the second slide, we did eventually manage to get the artwork installed, but that was the first major change to my work. Um, the second thing that changed uh, was that actually patient need and staff needed need changed. So we were in a situation where staff were under enormous pressures um, and needed support for their own well-being. And patients were coming into hospital with increased anxiety and for most of the year had no visitors or a visitor for an hour a day. So they were bored, they were anxious and they were stressed. So if we move on to the next slide, um, we had to completely rethink how we were going to support patients and staff during this time. And one of the first things that we looked at was print um, in terms of patient need. And we produced a number of activity booklets. So we, on the left here, um, we did a comic with the Phoenix comic, who I don't know whether any of you know, but they're an absolutely fantastic comic in Oxford. And we produced a comic book for children, which had a specially commissioned um, comic strip of preparing children for coming into hospital for an operation. We also worked with the Creative Dementia Arts Network, and we produced material for older patients. And through the generosity of wonderful artists who we'd worked with, we collated a lot of wonderful material for a coloring and puzzle book. And we put these into patient bags with cards and crayons and um, other little bits and pieces. So that these could be distributed to patients. And if we move on to the next slide, we also looked at how we would take some of the work that we do online. Um, we had quite a lively music program and we put this onto iPads. And one of the things that we found was that um, we could then communicate, the musician could communicate directly with patients. We were particularly focused on patients who were older. And for older patients, the whole experience of COVID, particularly those with dementia, was incredibly confusing. And for a patient to see a face, a smiling face on an iPad, and for that musician then to play them a request, we've had lovely responses to. And if we go to the next slide, we were also really conscious of how do we support staff. So I started off by putting quite a lot of material online to support staff wellbeing. We have a culture club where I send weekly emails to staff. We did a whole series of postcards, take time to relax with little bits of poetry or a little quiz or um, an origami, how to make an origami heart. And then we started doing online work with staff teams to help staff teams just stop for 10 minutes a day and fold an origami flower. Um, and we found that there were particular teams who really responded to this. We worked with a fantastic um, artist, Lizzie Burns, who created absolutely beautiful pieces um, and has a real skill at working online. And she does an online fold every week with origami. And we found that staff really responded to this. It was a way of absolutely switching off um, and I think my favorite bit of feedback from staff was one one member of staff saying this is our vaccine for well-being that creativity and they shared that with patients as well we also put together an exhibition um, of paintings and artwork created of staff and by staff I haven't in these slides included the wonderful portraits for NHS heroes uh, because I know Tom who has 
um, who started that fantastic project, we'll talk about them later, but we included a number of portraits of, NH of, of Oxford staff within that. We also had wonderful work by um, local artists who created pieces and one of our housekeeping staff in the intensive care unit who created the beautiful in, in wings image that you saw. So in a nutshell, Diane, that's how we responded. It's been quite a year. Ruth, that sounds incredible about how you, you made that shift to responding to the, the patients and the staff needs. Gosh, it really, um, it gives me goosebumps, really. So, uh, Ruth, as you know, the next question that we all are curious to know, and, and actually it's perhaps a burning question for all of us, isn't it, it of what or how, when you're looking ahead, how are you going to carry this forward? Uh, and so I'm curious in terms of the balance of the, the different stuff that you've done. So do tell us, Ruth, what are you going to take forward? Well, I think it's changed our way of working. I think we will continue to do more in print form. Um, we will continue to look at online activity where it works and have a kind of dual approach. Um, and one of the things that we're particularly focused on the next year onwards is staff well-being. Staff are absolutely wrong out at the moment. They've just been working full throttle. They're exhausted. Um, we're really, really conscious of how we can support them. Um, one of the things that's happened to me over this period is that I've become part of, um, I was already part of a, a steering group for a national network of hospital arts managers, but we've supported each other. We've had weekly meetings and we've shared um, the activities that we have been developing. Um, and actually one of the pieces I showed of print one, we've produced a kind of national board and bust um, um, newspaper that goes out to all hospitals that's been developed in Western Bristol. Um, but we've given each other a huge amount of support and we've been looking at what we can do in terms of the arts to support staff ongoing. And so we are at the R&D stage of working to develop a, a national project that will say a thank you to staff. It's across 22 trusts. And that will be a project that is, on the one hand, performative. There'll be something that performance-based or um, temporary-based that is socially engaged and is created from listening to staff, voice, staff voices that will happen all across 22 trusts on one day. We don't have that date as yet. And we're also helping those 22 trusts um, profile what they're doing in terms of commemorative pieces. And if we go to the next slide, um, one of the things we've been doing is, is really listening to staff experience. And we've recognized the, the value of, of teamwork over this last year. So we've been working with the most fantastic poet called Beth Calverley, who's been doing online workshops with teams of staff and they have co she co-writes poetry. So the poetry she creates is from staff words. Um, and then moving on to the next slide, we've also been thinking about commemoration. We, we're in a particular moment of history. Um, so we are um, looking at how we commemorate that moment of history, how we commemorate the lives that have been lost. This is the beginning of a project that we hope that we'll get funding for with the wonderful Harriet Riddell, who is a, an Art Weeks artist. Um, and she's been going into the vaccination hubs across the trust and stitching sketches of um, the whole process. It, so the vaccination programme in the hospitals has been one of the biggest programmes in terms of bringing together lots of different teams of staff. Um, all the work that I do is funded by Oxford Hospitals Charity, and so we have to raise money for everything. It's not NHS funded, um, and we go out to trusts and, and other um, grant-giving bodies and individual supporters, so we, we are hoping that we can find some funding for, for this project. But that in, in, is, is where we're at. We're particularly focused on staff wellbeing going forward. 
Ruth, that's wonderful. And uh, I must say, I'm quite struck by the fact that the masks are being used to be stitched on. And uh, just love that idea of um, plotting history, marking this uh, as history, but using the mask. So um, fascinating. So Ruth, wonderful to hear from you as a curator. And uh, we really are delighted that we've got a flavor with um, artists as well. So Ruth, thank you. And what I want to ask of the audience, uh, would you be really brave and pop a question in the chat box for Ruth? So at the end, uh, when each of the artists and um, Ruth has spoken, we're going to have time for some questions that Esther's going to manage. So uh, if you have, Anne, I can see you've got your glass of wine, pop a, um, a question in that chat box, I'm sure you have. So now we're going to move on to the first of our artists and uh, delighted to tell you a bit more about Miranda Creswell. And I will say that uh, I have learned an enormous amount about her. She studied at uh, Camberwell University of Arts in, in London. And uh, having met Miranda and I've known each other for many years, but only just caught up recently. And I was delighted to hear Miranda has this ability to get funding. So Miranda, I don't know if it's that you're particularly good at filling in those forms, but actually you have that ability to get funding and to collaborate. And so you've been an artist in residence, as I understand at the Nuffield Orthopedic Hospital. You've been an artist in residence in, in Paris. I had to have a pronunciation. I don't speak um, French, I'm afraid. I'm gonna leave that to you, uh, Miranda. And also, so this is the real um, beauty of how Miranda works, that she's been an artist in resident, uh, residence with Horatio's garden. And Miranda, I did find it fascinating doing some research and saw that one of the centers that you have worked with is the Spinal Treatment Center in Salisbury. And this is um, a picture of Horatio's garden and Stephen Hackett that uh, Miranda is going to tell us more about later. And also that there are various Horatio gardens around the country, Glasgow being, being one of them. And uh, Miranda does, you, again, another gift you have, Miranda, is this ability to collaborate with academia. And I do, that's a particular gift that you have. And I know that uh, when we chatted two weeks ago about this, that this book had just been published. So, and you've been working on it, I do believe, for five years. Give us a thumbs up. Is it five years, Mara? Two yeah. thumbs up. <laughs> five years. So, uh, just wonderful how you've been collaborating with the School of Archaeology. And so, really bringing a different approach to being an artist. And we look forward to hearing from you. So, as we do know now, and Miranda, you know that uh, I will be asking you these two questions, looking back, how have you responded to COVID? And then looking ahead, how or what will you carry forward? So Miranda, delighted to hear from you in terms of uh, looking back, how you responded to COVID. Hi, Diane, thank you so much. And, and hello, everyone. Um, it's very, it's lovely to, to see lots of um, artistic faces and people who are interested in the arts across the screens. It's fantastic. Um, so how I responded to COVID is probably fairly similar to a lot of other people, uh, a kind of, a, a kind of, you know, heart, you know, kind of feeling kind of vulnerable and um, how, how, you know, how to cope with this strange, extraordinary ph phenomena that came along out of nowhere, it seemed. And um, that vulnerability is, for me, was twinned with, um, with water, <laughs> strangely. And um, actually, maybe I'll start with the first slide, if you wouldn't mind, Diane, putting it on. Uh, the first slide is here, and this is, um, this is a, a, a detail of a drawing which was commissioned by Ruth Charity and in collaboration with the hospital school and funded by, by Oxford Hospital Charity. And it's so exciting because it hasn't gone up yet. And this is just a detail. To give you an idea, this drawing is 2.5 meters long by 1.5 meters. It's made with just simple pencil and paper. It's very, very simple. 
um, and yet it portrays 42 different species of, of plant and uh, insects and animals and fish. They're all uh, endangered. So they're highly endangered, all the, this, these particular um, uh, animals. So for instance, at the back, you probably can see a hare and a sea otter. Um, we have a penguin and a bumblebee, which is a yellow bumblebee, which is from Scotland. They all come from different places in the world. There's, a, there's this lemur here and a homer uh, butterfly from Jamaica. They're, they're all from different places and that yet they're kind of talking to each other. Um, and this is an idea that, that, that it, it, it kind of gave a nod to the extraordinary thing that happens in a hospital when, when people arrive in a hospital and basically sit next door to people who are also in, in a vulnerable state and, and you have to communicate and you have to support each other. So this drawing is, um, is going to be put in the, in the waiting area of, uh, of a ward called the Tom, Tom's Ward, which is um, the um, oncology, uh, near the oncology children's hospital. Um, and so if you can imagine people sitting there are feeling very vulnerable. And I was wondering how to, how to, to calm this drawing, how to make it, because my natural, my natural probably disposition is to make very vigorous work, but I didn't really feel that was quite what was needed here, it needed to be calm. And so over the top of the work, there's a high horizon line and the high horizon line is a sea and the sea is calm. And this strange calmness kind of made sense with me when COVID happened, because um, if we could have a second slide, I carried on my outdoor swimming. And this picture <laughs> is me swimming in, um, in fact, January. Uh, the, the, the water temperature is very, very cold. And um, I found myself doing this throughout the summer and then throughout the winter. And then we'll probably have um, the, the next slide, actually, it could be Andy, if you could put it on. And started painting these paintings, which before I hadn't really been painting like this before. It suddenly kind of all came out, and this is a feeling of of of, of human vulnerability in water, in calming water. And so this is called balanced. Um, I quite like the 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 the, the amount of water to so the smallness of the human being here. <laughs> um, and the next slide will show you other work. Um, this, for instance, on the left is called First Light in the River. Um, and in the winter months, there's extraordinary sun dawns that are very, very vigorous, in fact. Um, and this, these are all from my imagination, but they were just memories of the feeling of immersing myself in the water. And here on the right is Venus and the moon, where there's one, one time when I, I swam in moonlight. So, so these these were the, the pictures that, that I made um, for, uh, at that time. So in answer to your question, <laughs> um, it's, it was kind of vulnerability and, and water. So yeah, that's the answer to the first question. Uh, Miranda, thank you. And uh, I just find that so inspirational, seeing that, that picture of you swimming and in January, oh my goodness. And then to know that your art has come from that. So thank you. It helps me as a, a non-artist to understand more. But really now also are curious, just as we were with Ruth, what are you going to carry forward as you look ahead? So, um, so I was interested I've always been interested in collaborations and I'm, I'm interested in putting work out in different domains. I'm fascinated by that. And I realized that the museums were closed, the art galleries were closed, all entertainment was closed. And the only places where people went uh, were, were parks and parks became very, very important. And the river became important for me in a park. Um, and uh, I did a project a few, uh, a, a year ago probably, or no, two years ago now, with, with a lovely curator called Sarah Mossop. And she um, suggested that I could put uh, an original work in a notice board and have, you know, for a few days. And I extended that idea because I love the idea of the, the very simple notice board, the kind of lowly notice board being used not for a jumble sale or not for, a, you know, a safety rule, but an actual, watercolour so and not a reproduction I have to emphasize the actual watercolour so again 
vulnerability is, is coming to the fore here. So with this idea, I decided to um, contact um, uh, a group of archaeologists and, uh, and a wonderful group of archaeologists. And they're called, uh, actually, this is the last slide. So I, uh, could you possibly put, yes. But yes, yeah, so, so this, 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 um, this is Horatius Garden again, but to kind of come back, I decided to, 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 um, to go to this group, to ask this group of archaeologists who were studying rivers and they're studying rivers from the Iron Age and Bronze Age. They, they have a, a, a big program. And I suggested that we could put my work and their work together near river sites that were in the public domain. So this site is uh, in Horatio's, at Horatio's Garden in, in Salisbury. And here you have on the left, um, Stephen Hackett, who's the head gardener, and Olivia Chapel, the founder member of, of Horatio's Garden, and myself on, on the right. And this is one of my, my paintings. So the, the, the interesting here, here is that it, the painting, the notice board is at the right height for a wheelchair. Um, this is an outside domain and, it, and the watercolor will stay up here for, for a month. Um, so we might have the next slide, please. Um, and these, these notice boards, we've now have got 11 notice boards. We've got funding from um, Oxford University and Courtney Nomura, who, is, uh, who, who works as part of the research group. She, she, she's, uh, she's, she's an amazing person. And she took this idea on board and helped us get funding. And I couldn't have done it without her. Um, and that last uh, public notice board you see is somewhere in Lancashire and it's, in, uh, it's called Astley Hall. Um, and it's a very small notice board, but I heard last week um, that it had 8,000 people go past it in the last um, four weeks. And so that, are, that is the amount of people you might get in a park that come through um, qu uh, quite often. And so our 11 sites, we hope will have more. And then lastly, I just want to say it's so exciting because not only do you get a good lot of people coming through and looking at culture in a different way, but um, they've decided to take ownership of the idea of the notice board and they are fundraising to make their own notice board where they can put other artists' work. So it has a legacy. So that, Diane, is, is yeah, it's very exciting. <laughs> that, Miranda, that's, I could, that's wonderful. And I can hear your excitement and actually just so wonderful that you, you're leaving a legacy and are really inspiring others as a result of um, this, your response to COVID. So uh, thank you so much what a privilege to hear from you and we're now uh so do if you have any questions for miranda i can see we've got some things uh popping in the chat box esther's watching with great interest wondering how many questions we're going to have and i'm now going to move on to uh susie moxley as we do call susie and uh susie thank you for all your energy you put into this and Susie is a woman of many talents, from printmaker, this is her studio at the bottom of a garden, which if you get in fast now, you don't get to go to the studio, but you can see her Art Week uh, exhibitions in her house. What a privilege that things are opening up. Uh, Susie makes jewelry and uh, often spends time in, in Greece and uh, I know that that's a time which is really creative for her, where she can spend time on whether it's her art or whether it's her jewellery. And uh, not to be idle, she has also done some stained glass windows, and this was for the museum, uh, a museum in, in Reading. The other thing she exhibits regularly, and this was at the Affordable Art Fair. We're going to hear more about this uh, from Susie in her answer to the questions. And again, a woman of many talents, as I say, and uh, she was the designer of this um, book cover, which was a Booker Prize winner. And uh, she doesn't know I was going to put this in. Uh, Susie, I do know, as Esther said as well, that you were the one to start the art forum in Summertown 18 years ago. And uh, what a lovely richness it brings. There's so many things that happen in Oxfordshire Art Weeks. 
and we are delighted to be here this evening. Susie has uh, many other, um, she's often political in her art and I have the privilege of going on walks with her and would ask her, well, hang on, where does that come from? And so uh, understand that um, there is usually a history, for example, crossing the Aegean was about refugees crossing the Aegean Ocean. And this was an exhibition of 100 portraits. Tom, not to be in competition to you, this was a number of years ago, as we know. And uh, not only that, the, the challenging part, Susie um, at the same time had a chal challenging diagnosis herself and did numerous pieces of um, art about uh, having breast cancer and uh, a mastectomy and what a, a, how a surgeon might see this. So Susie, we are delighted to be asking you looking back how have you responded to covid and then as you know we will move on to the the next question susie over to you well thanks diane um i'm going to tell you about the weekend before lockdown when i was exhibiting at the affordable art fair in london it's the most exciting place because it's a huge, great big hall and it just it's it's really exciting to watch this place getting um, filled up with artwork and also the anticipation of of the reaction of people to my own work. But last year there was a foreboding atmosphere at the fair. There was a nervous energy on the preview night. The public flocked in and no one quite knew whether they should kiss each other or touch elbows or shake hands or we were still unmasked at that stage. And this, the sales at the, at the um, opening night reflected this nervous energy. It was like a sort of um, a frenzied last feast. People were going crazy and they were buying like mad. And it was a little bit like three weeks later or the next week actually, when people were going into the supermarkets and filling up their trolleys with loo rolls and paracetamol and the last bags of flour from the shelves. But COVID had already been around for about four months and now it was a pandemic, it had been declared as a pandemic and people were dying in China and Europe and America and Africa and here in the UK. At the end of the weekend, as it went on, it became obvious that we were in denial. We all bent over our telephones, there were few and few people coming into the fair, but we couldn't get out of the fair quick enough. But closing down a fair at the best of times is pretty chaotic. There are trucks that are being loaded up in the dark and the order that you arrive with, everything is neat and tidy when you arrive. And when you leave, it's chaotic. There's badly wrapped pictures and there's sort of loose um, boxes of screws and, and, and bubble wrap that you trip on. And it was just chaotic. We just couldn't wait to get out. Um, lockdown actually was announced three days later and COVID was about to now reveal that our freedom, our personal freedom was no longer and that we were going to be, our normality was going to be taken away. And I realized that all of my future planned exhibitions, which I had already planned for that year, had to be canceled. But mostly, I just felt that making art seemed irrelevant and totally pointless. But anyway, I went back into my studio and I made some rather large, frightened and angry marks on a collagraph plate. Diane, if you show the first slide, um, when I printed this picture, I noticed that the marks looked, looked a little bit like the round coronavirus shapes. So I began a conversation with this work. I added to the shapes and then I noticed that they seemed to be floating around a little bit. I added color and I gave it space and I gave it movement and I turned the paper upside down and I cut it up and I rearranged the pieces, sometimes making the picture balanced and then unbalancing it. The picture became larger and larger there just didn't seem to be enough space because I had so much to talk about and they just kept growing and growing. And this was the result. And I think it's rather confused and frightened and intangible. So I called the picture viral confusion. In the next picture, um, this is a picture called contained virus. I tried to contain my feelings to put them into a bowl or a container but I couldn't grab hold of them. It was almost as though these, the feelings were just slipping about. There was just no certainty at all. 
Then on our morning walks, I noticed that the streets were littered with gloves and masks. I inked up some gloves and some masks and I put them through my press. Despite the news of suffering and death, there was so much humor and creativity happening in lockdown. People were posting videos of doing silly things and singing in the empty streets. So I had my gloves playing cat's cradles. I called this piece, look after your PPE. It felt like the air that we were breathing was polluted. We were all filtering it through masks. So I made RNA sky, if you show that next picture, Di. The clouds here became twisted RNA of the coronavirus, ominously hanging over what was rather a drippy, undefined ground. I realized that the Greek word, I was studying Greek at the same time, um, the Greek word for inspiration is epneome, literally meaning to take in the spirit or the atmosphere or the breath. And I was inspired by the confusion and the fear and the intangibility of the time of COVID. And I think I responded by making a body of work that was free of the usual restraints of having to exhibit or to sell your work. And I think it became very pure and very, and very raw in a way. So that was my inspiration of, of the time of COVID. Susie, fascinating. And uh, I, I really enjoy understanding what's behind your pictures. And uh, so thank you for sharing that. I must say the cat's cradle and the PPE. I, I did have friends when, when I told them about your picture, they said, did Susie pick up the gloves? <laughs> so Susie, you'll have to, uh, when you tell us next, you'll have to tell us about that. And uh, so Susie, now looking ahead, as you know, the question is what or how are you going to carry this forward? Oh, it's a long story. Well, I grew up in South Africa and, you know, I never understood all my life. My father talked about picnicking on a precipice, but I didn't seem to, I never quite knew what it was that he was talking about. But now it seems that in this fragile world, that's exactly what we're doing. We're picnicking on a precipice because the virus has filled us with fear and taken the lives of so many people. The environment is in a knife edge. Jobs are threatened, AI, fake news, the noise of the internet is bombarding us, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, homelessness, movement and displacement of people, COVID, it just, there is just so much. But we're being challenged in so many ways, but somehow, somewhere, we each have to find our own way out of this. I grew up in South Africa, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. My childhood was privileged. My father was an architect. He designed a house near a thick bush of wattle trees that was full of vervet monkeys. We had to wade through the stream to get past the stink bug trees to get there, and the bullfrogs kept us awake at night. But South Africa was politically unspeakable. As a child, I knew little of what was happening. I didn't understand when my dad said picnicking on a precipice, because my concern at that time as a little girl at school was school, because I couldn't read and I was laughed at and I was teased. So why am I telling you the story? Because I discovered the wonderful world of creativity, a world where I could lose myself and, and I could imagine. I spent hours mucking around in my dad's workshop or molding clay that I found in the stream. I loved drawing the depths of looking that you had to do to copy a tree or a flower. I learned that there was another way of communicating other than reading and writing. And years later, when my children were small and I had no time to do my own work, when they were finally asleep at the end of the day and I felt totally washed up and exhausted, I remember sitting under a palm tree, staring at a palm frond that had fallen in the wind. I took it and I stripped it and I started to weave. And as I did it, I could feel a calmness and also an excitement as the shape developed in front of me. I wove and I bent and I twisted the leaves. I don't remember exactly what I was making. I think it was the process and the challenge of doing that that was so exciting and that relaxed me. The sculpture I made, in fact, was of a woman skipping and her hair blowing in the wind. Di, I think you can show that picture. Anyway, I'm deviating again, but what I'm trying to describe is the restorative power of creativity and the power that art communicates without words. It's such a basic human need, a healing need that goes beyond language. 2,500 years ago, 
the Greeks seem to understand this. Um, they built at Epidavros a hospital and an athletic stadium and the wonderful amphitheater all on the same site in the most beautiful natural setting because they believed that sports and arts and culture and nature should all be seen together equally of equal value in healing the body and the mind together. So I think we should never ever accept that art doesn't count, that it is something that we only do in our spare time, that museums and galleries should never be called non-essential and that they should never be closed again as they have been in lockdown because art offers imagination and a different perspective, humor and a reflection to see the world differently. The next slide, Di. I would like my COVID inspired pictures. This is one of them with all their confusion and loneliness and fear and intangibility to be seen and shared to reassure and confirm that it's okay to feel vulnerable in a world that is crashing around us. If we hide from the real tough things in the world, we'll never ever learn from them. COVID has, has really given me the inspiration to confront my own feelings in a world that has threatened and allowed me to imagine, to see the humor and hope. So looking forward, what will I take with me? I think it has to be the wonderful healing, restorative power of art and creativity and imagination as we picnic on this very edge of our current precipice. Susie, how amazing. Uh, and you will leave that challenge with all of us about uh, how we're going to approach that picnic, picnicking on a precipice. And uh, thank you for explaining uh, how you get that inspiration. And we look forward to being able to see more of your art. And I do see there have been some uh, lovely questions that have come in. Let us move on now to our next uh, artist. And I am delighted to be introducing you to Tom Croft. And uh, to tell you a bit more about Tom, those who don't know about him, he was regularly on the news, whether it was the one o'clock news, the 10 o'clock news, in fact, he even got onto the news in Japan. And Tom is a very humble man. I had to work hard, as most artists are, I had to work hard with each of them to say, please send me some pictures, please send me some pictures. So Tom, thank you for sending us these pictures. And Tom's going to tell you more about what he did, but I want to show you a few of the um, of the portraits that happened as a result of what Tom did. And Tom, I'm not going to say, I'm going to leave that to you to say. And so here are some more of the uh, portraits that Tom, uh, Tom with one Instagram uh, page was able to make happen. So Tom, as you know, you know the deal now, I'm going to be asking. I do. Uh, looking back, how have you responded to COVID? And then we'll also ask you, how are you going to carry it forward? So Tom, do tell us, how did you respond to COVID? Thanks so much, Diane. Well, I suppose if I'm being honest, that my initial response to the whole COVID crisis, certainly from a kind of artistic point of view, was to kind of grind to a halt, really, to, to completely freeze and to struggle to find that creative headspace that you need to, to create and I know having spoken to a lot of artists subsequently lots were feeling like that it was a very challenging time quite polarizing some people felt super motivated and creative others like me kind of ground to a halt so I thought about what I do and the fact that I'm a portrait painter and I thought well the one thing I can do is I could document somebody and I could celebrate them so I took to social media uh, to Instagram in particular, and I thought I'm going to offer a free portrait to an NHS key worker just as a means of saying thank you. It was lovely to go out and clap on Thursday nights, but that felt more for me than for them. So I wanted to do something a little bit more personal that kind of said, I see you, I thank you for what you do, and it's extraordinary what you're going through. And from a historical point of view, to kind of document that. So, Diane, I think you've got a picture, a rather ugly picture of my mug talking on social media. Uh, offering a free portrait to the first NHS key worker uh, to contact me. 
I then suggested that, there we go on the left, and I then suggested that other artists out there might like to offer too. Uh, and if they were to paint a free portrait for an NHS worker, perhaps they could post it under the hashtag to collate all these images together, portraits uh, for NHS Tom, heroes. So Tom, I called it that. Yeah. Tom, can yes. you say that again? Yes. Your Wi-Fi was slightly wobbly and we want to hear that. So just go back to um, what you asked the other artists to do. Sure. Um, so I asked other artists who wanted to take part to post their paintings online on Instagram under the hashtag portraits for NHS heroes. So it was a way of collating all these paintings. So if you go onto Instagram now and have a look under that hashtag, you'll see unbelievably thousands of portraits that were then produced. So the portrait you're looking at here is the nurse who contacted me called Harriet Durkin. She works in Manchester Royal Infirmary as an A&E nurse, and she had just contracted COVID. She was recovering at home, and she was about to go back into the front line to do her first shift in COVID times wearing this PPE gear. She sent me this extraordinarily powerful image, which in fact was a message she was sending to her mum just to say, hi, mum, I'm terrified, but I'm about to go in and, you know, I, I know people don't like using sort of military terms here, but sort of battle on our behalf, and here I go, wish me luck. And I also thought from an artistic point of view, you could also have a different connotation where she's just saying, just wait there. There's this reminder of the need for social distancing at the time. And I just felt it was a very powerful and very personal image she shared with me. So in the spirit of wanting to kind of document Harriet, that's what I did. And amazingly, thousands of other portraits, as I say, were produced under this initiative. And the next slide is um, in fact, the Google Arts, I'll come back to that one if I may, or I can dip in now and say that in fact that was, oh yeah, there we go. So Google Arts and Culture contacted me um, and said, look, we see that, you know, with lots of people are doing these portraits, we would like to host an exhibition space online so that people can go and have a look at them. And they created for free this wonderful space uh, with lots of different narrations. You can go in and hear audio and video about um, art and mental health, the kind of benefits of it. Um, and you can read what it was like for the NHS workers at this absolutely horrific time uh, and see how artists react. So it's a beautiful space. The next thing to happen was, um, well, the, uh, let's talk about this picture. So this is Harriet. I, I said I wanted to kind of raise the status and profile of, of an NHS worker. And I got her onto the big screen at Piccadilly Circus. So that was enormous uh, fun for me, but also kind of had a had a serious message that you know we 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 respect you, we thank you, we can't we need to do more for you, but this is all I can offer as an artist. So it was something. Uh, but then Bloomsbury contacted me, the publishers, and they said they'd like to create a fine art book, a kind of beautiful coffee table book of three hundred of the portraits. And I'm really proud to say that all royalties go to NHS charities together so it is a permanent physical record of some of these portraits uh, but it's also a means of kind of raising some some money for the NHS so it's a lovely thing and it is still available so please support your local independent bookstore try and buy a copy there or you know the big gargantuan online booksellers will sell you one too uh, so please uh, if you can uh, support this so I guess I don't know how I'm doing for time Diane but I'm going to say that at the beginning there, um, from that kind of initial stasis and kind of not knowing what to do, I found my kind of purpose again, if you like, in, in what I do through uh, this initiative. Tom, this is so amazing. And actually, do you know what's so lovely, Tom, is it gives uh, those of us who are not artists, but we could go and get that book or give that book as a, as a gift. And um, so just wonderful. And it all came from that one Instagram post quite incredible tom so would love to know uh, tom so how has your life changed and what or how are you going to carry this forward well in terms of carrying this forward i definitely my sort of initial goal when i said look will people take part and let's if we get enough people we could have this big physical exhibition so that we can all say thank you to the nhs and so um, that is still my ambition. It was lovely to have this Google online exhibition, which again, I encourage you all to go and have a look at if you haven't already. Um, but I'm in talks with uh, the v &A, uh, and the Mal galleries, and it looks like we should get a really good physical exhibition of these, of these paintings. So I'm really thrilled and excited that 
something, you know, a small thing in the grand scheme of things, but something positive that gives them a chance to, to be elevated, I think is so important. So, so that's one thing. Um, another thing I suppose is uh, the, from, from my own kind of take home, if you like, is what social media actually can do. Because I had a really dim view of it and sort of thought, well, it's, it's a pretty vile space and it's full of trolls. And if it's not that, it's people kind of, you know, banally posting their latest bowel movement and expecting people to take an interest. So I never understood it. After my daughter explained that actually Instagram is moderated to be a slightly nicer space. And actually, if you're an artist, it's in entirely kind of image based so you can put up your latest work or a progress shot of your latest work and you reach immediately potentially a global audience and i just think if you for somebody in my generation i, I can remember when i came out of art college taking an advert out in the oxford times bless the oxford times uh, and it was so small because i couldn't afford a big one it was you know tiny font letters you could barely read and it said uh, Tom Croft portrait painter based in Jericho let me know if you want to commission a portrait of course nobody probably three people saw it and nobody commissioned me um, but the, the, but in now to think that as an artist and my daughter coming through is is interested in art there's a chance for you to have a go because you can put your work out there people can see it immediately from all around the world they can potentially commission you or buy art so I've had a kind of change of view on uh, social media, the positive side of social media with art. And, and also, of course, as a means of connecting communities. I now speak to artists I wouldn't have spoken to otherwise. Uh, and, and I've had the privilege of talking directly to NHS workers who tell me how they're doing. And we, we keep in touch through this whole process. And I find out how they're, how they're doing in it. So the whole thing has been an a entirely life-changing experience for me. Uh, and I'm enormously grateful to everybody who took part. So um, yeah, Diane, that's that's kind of where I'm at with it. So, Tom, tell us about this uh, artists and illustrators and and also, Tom, the Hello magazine. Did you? Uh, did, so, Tom, you must be pretty cool with your daughters to be able to say not only now you're using Instagram, but you actually have appeared in the Hello magazine as well. So tell us, Tom, about that. And then so can you tell us uh, just in yeah. uh, two sentences and then I'm going to hand over to Esther for to see what questions we have from the audience. Well, I can confirm my daughters categorically don't think I'm cool in any way. Uh, I'm just deeply embarrassing, as as I assume most dads probably are, are thought of by their daughters. Anyway, um, it was it was truly bizarre to appear in things like Hello Magazine. I'm just annoyed they didn't show the inside of my house and me kind of reclining next to my easel. But there we go. Um, but no, it, it was just lovely to get recognition for the NHS workers and through these portraits. So that's obviously the major thing. All the all the other nonsense is is simply that. Tom, thank you. And uh, we have uh, f some time left. So what we're going to do is we will end the webinar at, uh, well, at half past on the hour, knowing we have people from various countries. And uh, Esther is going to manage some questions now. And then at 29 minutes past, we'll pass back to me and we'll, we'll just close it. You're welcome to leave if you want, but I just need a thumbs up from the artist and curator, Ruth. Are you happy to stay on for 10 more minutes? Because there are a number of questions uh, from the, Esther, can you stay on as well? There are a number of questions from the audience, but do feel free if you need to leave at 7.30, by all means do that. So Esther, over to you and the questions and to hear more from our curator and artist. Okay, well, we've had some lovely, lovely supportive messages and, th and thank you from people who've really enjoyed the artist talks, curator talks, so thank you. Um, I will just ask two questions. Well, I will ask two people to ask their questions first because that might take us towards um, 7.30. Um, and then some of the others will have to ask, I think, in that extra 10 minutes. But if I can first ask Lawrence Norman if he would like to ask his question of Ruth. Um, he's interested in the relationship of, between art and well-being and where he sees that going forward. So if you can ask your question, Lawrence, in, in just you know, one sentence and Ruth wow. on the same. Okay, I'll take the reins. Right, okay. <laughs> Hi, Tom. <laughs> um, so Ruth, I've, I've um, in my 
professional career supported mental health awareness and things like that and and what resonated with me during your your talk was how much creativity and art um in no matter what format it is whether it's music or or literature or art um can help people and i think actually that's been emphasized in the last year so amazingly um and i i personally um passionately think that there is a big 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 future for it so um with you having some experience within that where where do you see this this kind of collaboration between creativity and well-being going in the future well i think it's a really interesting question i think people have recognized um the effects of art and on well-being particularly over the last year and staff have, have recognized this within you know a small project like the origami project what I would love is um, what's been done at a hospital, of course I've escaped which one, where they have just opened a print studio within the hospital and they are running print courses for staff um, and patients within the hospital. Um, so there is a, there is a, a change happening um, in terms of the way that hospitals are being perceived. Um, in Bristol at Southmead Hospital, uh, North Bristol Trust, they have an annual creativity festival where they bring a huge number of creative practitioners into the hospital to engage with staff in, and patients in different areas. And that's more than one sentence, <laughs> but it's, there's a change. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Esther, do you want to just come off mute? Uh, thank you. If we now we have a question um, from Ali Hogg, who um, is asking about the shift from real life to digital and as social distancing, whether we will have that in the future. So Ali, would you like to ask your question to Tom and then perhaps Susie, you can respond to. Thank you. Um, thanks, Esther. Um, really, the my my thoughts about that question uh, started when Ruth um, was showing us her uh, really fantastic slides of um, what she and uh, and her organizations were doing actually physically in the hospital and I was struck by the how fantastic it would be to get involved in a comic book um, and pass that out in the ward so um, you know patients would be uh, taken away from their worries for for a short space of time and comic books and magazines have always been part of you know modern kind of art history um for for many reasons um and tom particularly has seemed very uh capable and competent of understanding on the online gallery um technology and of course we have missed an art week last year and it was online and you guys have done an amazing job of facilitating that but how as artists and um, curators do you feel about the difference between um looking at a work of art in a gallery uh, or in someone's home in the case of art weeks and looking at a screen and having to try to continue with a, a very high uh, sort of level of interest and engagement but you're looking at effectively a, a a false image and and how other artists have um taken that opportunity and are now making digital art that seems to be capturing a certain audience and i just wondered if you felt more connected less connected more frustrated mm -hmm. because you know you guys are, are are all involved in the physical making of an object mm. so is that to me ali it's to anyone who would like to comment yeah I well I, we I mean go. oh yeah over to you tom yeah no i was just going to say that um the great thing about digital art and being able to go in a, i mean it's an obvious point but to go in an online gallery is that it's completely accessible to anybody who's got a phone or a computer so rather than have to travel up to london to see an exhibition and park a car and all the expense of that i love how instantly accessible it is so i think it's got an enormous role to play and obviously within the through the lens of a kind of pandemic it's, it's been essential and so we are all having to adapt fast to the new way uh, but does it replace does it even come close to matching the experience of walking into a gallery in a physical space seeing the texture of the in my case paint 
the the subtlety of the tonal shifts. Of course, it doesn't. It's it's nothing in in my opinion. I I don't think it's anywhere near. Uh, and there is something about yeah being something that moves you in a completely different way uh, if you're entering a, a physical space. But I think the two uh, kind of live alongside each other and kind of complement each other. You know. And Susie. As you come up, Susie, come off mute, please. Um, I agree with you, Tom. I mean, it's it's it, we're able to see things. I mean, the people watching this from Swaziland and from South Africa and from Greece and all over the place, and we're able to come together on the screen. But actually, in the last couple of days, when I've had my art week open, and people have come. The conversation that we haven't talked about is COVID. If you go onto the street, everybody's anxious. They're talking about their, their health. They're talking about the situation that they're in. But looking at pictures, people are they're transported. They're taken into a different world. And I think that's what, um, what actually seeing the object in front of you does. But I do think to go back to the question that Ruth answered before is sort of on the same question. Um, there are two aspects to the art. There's the creating of it, which is one thing, which is brilliant if you're an artist and well, brilliant for anybody because you get lost in, in, in the actual making. But, and then there's the other side of it, which is the viewing of it. And obviously you can't do the creating online, but you can do the viewing online. Um, but I think it's worth noting that there are two aspects that are vitally important, both of them. Okay, thank you. Um, Diane, over to you. Um, Esther, thank you. And Esther, it's been great having you manage the question. So delighted uh, that we've had that. So really, we want to say to, uh, so Esther, I wouldn't mind one last word from you, if you would like to say that. And then once Esther has said uh, goodbye on behalf of Oxfordshire Art Weeks, if you want to stay on, the artist and curator are happy to do so. So for another 10 minutes, we will be staying on if uh, any Anybody else wants to explore those questions or others. So one final word from you, Esther, and do feel free to leave if you want. Uh, do stay on if you would like to stay. Okay, well, I'll be very quick so that we can get back to the questions. Um, but I'd like to say a very, very big thank you to Susie first for organising tonight's event, for being the, the kind of idea that got, got the ball rolling. And then to Diane of Connecting to Excellence for just being the most brilliant host um, and her technical support, Joe, for making everything happen smoothly. The pair of them, Diane especially, has put so much time and effort in behind the scenes to make this event run smoothly. Um, and thank you for, to the speakers who've been brilliant, absolutely fascinating, interesting. Um, yes, we're all clapping. Um, and thank you all for coming along and being part of it. It's the first time we've tried something like this. Um, and so it'll be interesting to hear um, what you think afterwards. And I hope that you'll enjoy um, visiting some real events, seeing some real things in real life and the texture and the shades and all of that um, over the next 10 days. So thank you very much for coming. And if you've enjoyed this evening, could you give a thumbs up? And uh, Joe is going to take some screenshots Keep your thumbs up because he's got a few screens to get through. Uh, so thank you and a big smile from the artists because you will um, you'll be going on social media, Tom, on your Instagram. On uh, so uh, thank you to everyone and uh, Esther, well done too. So do um, say farewell if you want to. If you want to stay on, more than welcome to. So um, Esther, back to you. Okay, well, well, I'm going to go to um, Kevin and Alex, who asked a couple of questions, but in the same vein, um, about the, dis the time between thinking of something or having the experience and then um, putting those ideas down. So Kevin and Alex, if you would like to ask your questions, um, and we'll put them first to Miranda and then to Susie. Right. Hello. Um, thank you. Yeah, the same. I'm an artist, so I understand the idea of doing stuff from memory and also doing it from life. And I'd just like to know all of the artists who've spoken tonight, who whose work I really appreciate and um, would love to see in real life, how much time between doing the thinking and putting it in a visual form. And then and one of my questions was about between the first sketches and deciding it's finished. 
or the final version of it is ready for public viewing? Um, thank you. It's a really interesting question, Matt. Um, I think one of the reasons for doing swim, for, for the swimming being so powerful for me was that it was wasn't so much almost a kind of to do just with your brain. It was a whole body memory, <laughs> and uh, that that feeling of of your body responding when you're painting is probably quite familiar as a painter that you don't just paint with your hands. You you, you paint with your whole whole self, I guess. And so that, that is probably, uh, so that the, the amount of time is, I'm not quite sure, I can't really answer that question. It's really as, as uh, how you can remember it with, with, with all your being really, I suppose. <laughs> and it's a bit like when you're looking at a, at a picture of a person and, or you're doing a, a drawing of some, of, of a port, for a portrait, the, 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 the lines really mean that you've really looked at that person and uh, you really felt them. So I suppose, yeah. But you, you must know that too. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, good question. And Susie? Depends what you're doing. I mean, I have done work where I know exactly what I'm going to do, and particularly with print, because um, you have to make the plate and you have to make duplicate plates and you have to go through the whole um, process of, of registering things. But I think in the pictures that I showed you on, on to this evening, the COVID pictures, they were very much... Um, they were just, I made the marks first and then the, the marks dictated to me. And it was, it was a conversation between, between the piece of paper and myself where they were saying, the paper was saying to me, it's not quite right, so turn it around. And I would turn it around and then it'd say, but now it needs a little bit of color. And um, so it was evolving. It was very much, I was very much, I didn't know what the end result was going to be. And it was very liberating to be able to just kind of free fall with it. Um, it really does depend what, what it is that you're working on. Okay, and we also had a question about how um, you, Ruth, um, would approach, whether you would approach different artists now, given that the environment has changed over the last year, or are you asking existing artists, existing artist contacts to adapt the way they work? Well, for every project, we start anew. So I research every project from, a, from the beginning. But one of the things I've really noticed is the kind of move towards biophilic images and the um, debate around the power of nature. And it's very interesting to see that staff are particularly interested in bringing the outside in, bringing landscape into hospitals. And it's always been there, but the debate has has got, I would say, stronger over the last year. That, the power of green. Okay, and we have one, another question for you, Ruth, which is, do you consider um, how patients will take home their artwork um, and, you know, after their visit so that they can continue to process their experience? Well, we'd love to be able to, to you know, give artists, uh, patients prints and things like that it would be gorgeous, but if, the financial side probably wouldn't stack up but in terms of the uh, coloring books and puzzle books they contain beautiful reproductions of artwork and um, one of the things I've done in terms of collating material from artists is being in, in a way we sort of curated those books for to contain the very best of the artwork that has come through to us so we can offer patients um, an ability to look at beautiful artwork, but also engage in the process themselves and colour and doodle and draw. Okay, brilliant. And I think just a final question from Bev Jones. Um, if she, she was interested about um, more to hear more of the notice board project um, from you, Miranda. If you'd well, like to like ask question, Bev. Yes. Where are you? Um, hi. <laughs> Uh, what would you like to, to know about, uh, did you want to know about how to put work in the notice boards, is that? Yes, I think that was a... That was a question. So um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question because each of the 11 sites is their own community. So basically what we did is we, we've just started the kind of whole chain. So in fact, there is a, there, there's a, a website uh, which is called the, the Ebb and Flow website, which is an academic website. And as part of that, 
um, the 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 um, the, the artwork is called the ripple effect. So if you Google that, you'll see all the different sites and, and or do message me and we can uh, we can talk about this because I feel the more people use notice boards, the, the better. You know, I, I just want to launch this idea um, because I think it's quite exciting and it's so accessible. Um, and and I, I, my, my work hasn't really suffered at all. You know, there wasn't even one drop of rain and I just put it up for three or four weeks. So it doesn't have any light pollution. So it, it is a, an exciting way to show work. <laughs> That's great, thank you. So I think we've covered the questions now. So I'll pass back to Diane for the final wrap up, but thank you very much, everybody. Uh, so a huge thank you to everybody. Huge thank you uh, from New York to South Africa, to Greece for people uh, joining in and to local in Oxfordshire, Jericho and around. Thank you very, very much. We are going to send out a survey monkey. Uh, Joe will be doing that to ask whether you would be interested in this carrying on. Will this carry on and go forward into uh, next year? So do be, uh, if you would like to fill in the survey monkey, and uh, as a company, we specialize in working with teams and you, we will ask you some questions if you uh, if anybody's interested in that as well. So thank you very much, everybody. So if the artists and curator and Esther could stay on and Joe, uh, could we give one final give a thumbs up and a huge thank you to Joe McKenzie, who works very, very hard behind the scenes. Joe, thank you for all your hard work in keeping us all together. And tell us when you're done, Joe. Fab. Good night. Have a good evening.